Creme 2 News begins now. Thank you for joining us on Creme 2 Plus. I'm Tim Pham. This is your Creme 2 News Week in Review. Join us as we take a closer look at some of the biggest stories in the Inland Northwest this past week. While a grand jury may be an unfamiliar concept for most. Grand jury system exists in the Constitution. It's in the Fifth Amendment. It's been around since 1776. Trial attorney Mo Hamoudi says it is a legal strategy that safeguards a highly publicized case. Since the process is done behind closed doors, instead of the public preliminary hearing, it can protect the defendant and witnesses. The witnesses feel much more comfortable, sometimes freer to talk. Hamoudi says that can play against the defense because a grand jury isn't an adversarial process. No cross-examination. The only authority that uh, the defense attorney has is nothing. Can't do anything. Another plus for the prosecutor, keeping their case theory secret until trial, as they only present some of the evidence. The grand jurors ask questions to the witnesses. They're free to do that. And they're free to ask the prosecutor to produce witnesses and produce additional evidence. They have subpoena power. And since a majority of those jurors agreed to indict, Hamoudi says it can also point to the strength of the case we'll see play out a trial, a vote of confidence for the state moving forward. Absolutely, because what the prosecutor received was a positive nod by members of the public with respect to some of the evidence that they've collected thus far. Our Verify team has been looking into several claims and questions to help you sort out what's true and what's not true about the Koberger indictment. So let's start with the claim there was a secret trial, one person on Twitter implying that Koberger is not getting a fair process. Well, this claim is false. A grand jury does their work in secret, but they don't decide guilt or innocence only if there's enough evidence or probable cause to move forward with charges. Before a felony case can move forward in Idaho, the prosecution has to prove there's enough evidence to make a case. This can be done through either a preliminary hearing or through a grand jury, which leads us to our second question. Will there still be a preliminary hearing coming up in June? Well, the answer to that is no. The grand jury indictment serves the same purpose as the preliminary hearing in this instance, allowing the case to move forward. We've also received questions about the grand jury. When did they meet and what evidence was presented? Well, the answer to this remains unknown at this time. Idaho law requires members of a grand jury to keep secret whatever is said or done in proceedings. The judge also sealed the names of all the witnesses who appeared. Court documents show the grand jury presented the indictment to the judge yesterday, but did not reveal any other details about when or for how long the grand jury met. Now, we can also verify the case is staying in Latah County. There is a new judge assigned to the case, but it has not been moved. One final question, will Koberger face the death penalty if he's convicted? The answer right now, well, that's just not known right now. The prosecution has not yet filed to seek the death penalty, but they still could before the trial gets underway. Shannon Gray says this indictment is good news. The judicial process is moving forward, but it, the time it took to get here hasn't been easy on the Gonzalez family. It's been over four months since we heard attorney Shannon Gray speak for Kaylee Gonzalez's family after Brian Koberger's first court appearance. It's obviously an emotional time for the family seeing the defendant for the first time. Um, this is the beginning of the criminal justice system and the family will, will be here for the long haul. The next step in the long haul is coming sooner than expected. A grand jury indicted the murder suspect, meaning the family is getting ready to be back in court next week. We'll be there for the arraignment on Monday and then just looking forward to the, you know, continuing the judicial process. Gray says he found out about the indictment through email Tuesday. Up until then, he says the Gonzalez family has been preparing to see Koberger in June, a timeline he already had a problem with. Once you've charged someone with an inf on an information, you're normally a preliminary hearing within a couple weeks out. And they said six months out. You know, and I don't think that really was of, um, you know, it's that's hard for a victim's families, for all the victims' families. That's hard. Gray says he feels like there's been delays in the court process. He says the months with no updates have been hard on the victims' families. We're ready for the to get things going on this. You know, I think the family is, everyone is, all the victims' families are. He says calling on a grand jury was long overdue. We're glad that they're 
they took it to a grand jury and indicted him, which was the smartest thing to do from the beginning. Gray says while he hasn't been happy with how long it's taken to get to this point, he hopes the end result is one in favor of the prosecution and a murder suspect is brought to justice. In the newsroom, Janelle Finch, Creme 2 News. Shift and Grind Coffee Stand is just one of the places here in St. Mary's now taking donations for Renee Brousseau, whose 14-year-old daughter Peyton died in that fire overnight Sunday. Donation jars are already filling up at the coffee stand. An account has also been set up at P1FCU in town to help with the financial burden. The home and a neighboring one are total losses. The Idaho State Fire Marshal Service says the fire started with a damaged electrical cord on a chest freezer. The St. Mary's superintendent tells me they have crisis counselors now in the schools to help any students or staff who may be struggling. In St. Mary's, Shannon Mowdy, Creme 2 News. In a small community like this, everybody's hurting. Surrounded by trees and nudged against the St. Joe River, the town of St. Mary's seems so protected. It's a place where neighbors become family and where a devastating loss is felt by everyone. You see how much this beautiful child's life mattered to so many people. The flowers are laying in honor of 14-year-old Peyton Hutchison. The high school freshman was home on Sunday night, Mother's Day, when an electrical cord caught fire. The family says Peyton's mom ran to the store for just a few minutes and came back to this. Her daughter trapped inside a fire that moved swiftly through their home. Despite efforts, no one was able to save Peyton. Peyton's aunt and a family friend sat down with Creme 2 to talk about the teen, wanting to spread the love and light that Peyton gave all of them. Always smiling, like always smiling and just lit up the room. You just couldn't help but love the child because it just had the purest soul. Her family says the smoke detectors were working, but say Peyton was wearing headsets and likely never heard an alarm. Peyton had sensory issues, so the headsets and music provided peace and comfort. But now her family fears they could have also contributed to her death and want other families to be aware. Peyton fell asleep every night with her headphones on which a lot, of, a lot of kids these days do anyways. And since, you know, any child like that, like oh, headphones are a saving grace most time in a situation like this, like she, she possibly didn't hear the smoke detectors. Peyton's family describes her as a sweet and shy girl most of her life until she hit high school. They say she joined the band, found music, a supportive teacher, and discovered her voice. Going into her freshman year, she was this blooming. The family says they want her voice to continue to resonate by giving back in honor of the teen. She loved life. The family talked a lot about Peyton's love of animals, especially her dog Scout. The chocolate lab also died in the fire. She was in the house to try to save Peyton and she we got her to an emergency vet in Coeur d'Alene but there she had she would have had to have complete body skin grafts, multiple surgeries. The family says donations to the Humane Society in honor of Peyton and Scout would be welcome. The family also says that since Peyton loved playing in the band, donations to St. Mary's High School Band Program would be appreciated. Her light is still going to be giving. And I think that's the most important thing is how, how can we, and it's very important to my sister, that we... How do we shine? How do we keep shining this light? The family is adamant that Peyton's story be motivation for positive and that whatever lessons can be learned from the fire come later. That now, they say, is a time to be thankful for the 14 years that Peyton was here and thankful that there is a community that loved her and now grieves with the family. Reporting in St. Mary's, Laura Papetti, Creme 2 News. This is a tree that was struck with lightning during last night's storm. You can see the line that was left from the lightning strike and the electricity from the lightning burst one of the pipes causing the house to flood. It was just white smoke blowing all over the place, but there was fire in there. Ryan Jenkins and his family were enjoying the thunderstorm when they heard a large boom. They didn't realize something was wrong until... It, um, 
burnt my hand because I was plugged into the 110 with my iPad just playing around. Ryan also started smelling smoke. That's when he knew he had to evacuate his family. I really had to get out of the house. Like, I felt like I was going to pass out. It was pretty intense. The surge from the lightning burst one of the house's pipes, causing the house to flood. The lightning also burnt wires throughout the house, filling it with smoke. This is where the fire was at. Most of it uh, was in this area here. So, yeah, water was pouring out of here. Every little vent had smoke coming out of it. Ryan said the North Bench Volunteer Fire Department arrived only 20 minutes after their initial 911 call. They did an awesome job. Um, they came in, looked around at everything, found where the, the fire was at in the house. In less than three hours, the fire department worked their way through the house and determined there were no hot spots or pipe leaks. Blew this out, which is down there on the ground, and then it smoked out this and it came out of the deal up there. Unfortunately for the Jenkins family, their entire house was in shambles. The ceiling was raining. It was coming out of all the light fixtures, out of the water, out of the power outlets. It was, it was something. More than 12 hours later, their carpets and floors still have puddles of water on them and electricity is out. But even amidst the chaos, Ryan's staying positive. It is what it is. Family's safe. Animals are fine. Um, we didn't lose, you know, a lot of our valuable stuff. Uh, Thank God it just didn't catch on fire the rest of the house. His neighbors have offered food and clothes, and people are offering them a place to stay. Ryan says that insurance should cover most of the costs. The family says they're looking to rent an RV to stay in while the house gets fixed, and renovations could take several months. In Bonners Ferry, Nathan Hyun, Krem 2 News. At face value, I, be I, I believe the intent of most of the council members was to mainly have oversight to the policies. The biggest question for so many is about banning books. Say city council wanted to remove all purple books from the library. The city council or mayor will not initiate any book ban. So no, the council cannot ban a book outright, but council does have the final say to confirm or deny a ban if the library board chooses to remove a book. If council can't initiate a ban, can they still control the collection and what books come into circulation? If the ordinance goes into effect, then the council would have the right to bring back this um, collection development policy and um, have the discussion with the board about making changes. This one's a bit more ambiguous. Mayor Chris Kaminska says while the council can't make up a new policy, they can suggest a change and reject any changes to policy. It could open the door to, to a, a big circle, a never ending circle of a, rejections and rewrites. And the decision is far from final. Mayor Kaminska's has until next week to veto the ordinance. My goal is to get through that process by the end of the day tomorrow. Shannon Mowdy, Crem 2 News. The North Hill neighborhood voted in favor of putting pride flags on at most seven of these poles in the Garland District. Businesses also have a choice to opt out. Businesses don't have to wait until June to promote Garland Pride or Pride themed pub crawls. But next month, the North Hill neighborhood chair says the Garland District is organizing a neighborhood wide display of pride. Rainbow flags on a Vista owned street lamps. It's about seven poles in total. Uh, from about here, actually, all the way down uh, to about the Garland Brewery. Scott Webb says the council approved the idea in April. At the May meeting, he says businesses wanted to reopen the conversation. We did vote as a community, including with the business owners in May, uh, to pass the motion as we did in April uh, with the amendment. If anybody didn't want the flag directly in front of their business, uh, we would honor that decision. Webb says some of the businesses not in favor say they're worried about the flags affecting foot traffic. They believe that the idea is too divisive. Um, some of them are concerned about the foot traffic into their businesses that by us displaying the flags um, could have a negative effect on their customer base to come into the neighborhood. One business owner says he's already planning to not have a flag on the pole outside his door. Another business owner says he doesn't mind either way. Webb says he wants everyone to feel respected. Whether what side are you on, we want to make sure that everybody has a right to be supported in, in our neighborhood. If a business does or does not want a flag displayed outside of its business, neighborhood chair Scott Webb says the owner should email him and he'll forward that message to Avista. From the Garland District, Janelle Finch, Crimson News.
tell us a little bit about who Pat Chun is. Well, I, I always tell um, anyone who's willing to listen that you know my, my story in sports actually predates my birth. So my dad came to the United States in 1969. My mom followed in 1970. But my dad, his first job was at the downtown YMCA in Youngstown, Ohio. So uh, that odd twist of fate, he actually came here to teach Taekwondo. So I was like, I, my parents are essentially, I tell them, are a stereotype. My dad's a Taekwondo instructor. My mom literally still works in the, uh, as a cashier in the grocery store in her hometown still to this day. When you're growing up and you're different, you know, you're, you're kind of inward focused. But then as you get older, you kind of you, you, you have to, you, you learn over the course of time that, man, what your parents had to go through mm. to come to a different country, to learn a new language. I know a lot of Asian American Pacific Islander parents, they come with this American dream. Um, and my parents were no different. And I tell everyone they, they had two tools in their tool belt. It was gonna be education and a work ethic. Uh, but because my dad's first job was in Ohio, I was born in Youngstown, raised in Cleveland, grew up this diehard Ohio State fan. I was one of those kids in a state that wanted to go to the big flagship institution in his home state and ended up going to Ohio State and um, graduated from there, but got my start in college athletics there. Your parents, I'm sure, are extremely proud of you. First athletic director in a Power Five school as an Asian American. Uh, what does that mean to you to have that distinction? Well, it means my mom can brag at church. <laughs> so that's probably the, the most important thing for, for, my mom, for my mom. But it's one thing to be the first, but it's a problem if you're the last. So I think that's always been my focus is I recognize the importance of representation. You know, I, I know growing up in this country, there just weren't a lot of Asian Americans that you would look up that, that you could just see in sports. Um, you know, whether it's competing and, and things, you know, it's just one of those things. That if you don't see it, it's just hard to believe it. You know, I always tell people, if you look at who the minority groups or the underrepresented groups are in college athletics, we're the minority of the minorities. So it's, it's nice to be able to, to celebrate, you know, a lot of the success, success stories that are going around college athletics, but also it's a nice opportunity to hear a success story of, of others. You know, hearing your back, background story is, is, is great to hear. You know, it's awesome to hear someone, you know, it's just, it just, it's empowering for everybody when you, when you have representation. Tell us about the award. I know you're modest about it, but being inducted into the Asian Hall of Fame, what was that about? When you see the list of people that are in that Hall of Fame, it's, it's really humbling uh, because you have some, some people that have really done things to change the narrative of Asian Americans in this country. So it's really humbling to be associated with that. But also on the flip side, it's also, I, I hope, you know, when I look at that award and when I think about that award, although I personally don't like celebrating it, it is a, it is a reflection of everybody associated with my life and my family's life. And that to me is, is a really, really big thing, really big point of pride for us. I've always been of the belief that the most important word is believe. And what you believe is what you become. And, you're, and what you believe ultimately dictates your behaviors and, and your behaviors ultimately dictate your habits. We got a more detailed look into two different designs that would expand capacity in the Spokane County Jail system. Now, in the county's planning meeting, the project manager laid out future growth built into each of these designs and how much it will cost to build them. Those who support a new Spokane County Jail believe this will alleviate overcrowding. The county's plans include keeping the existing jail to house high-level offenders, and the new facilities would be located north of it. Both design options include a community correction center and a new housing tower. Option one shows a more simplistic design. Its 2028 total construction cost is about $309 million. The community correction center would have 128 beds. The new housing tower would have five floors and 768 beds, but the fifth floor would be a shell floor saved only for future expansion with a range of 130 to 260 more beds. The second design option shows a 2028 total construction cost of about $337 million. 
The Community Correction Center would have 192 beds. The new housing tower would have five floors with 640 beds. However, half of the fourth floor and the entire fifth floor would be reserved for future expansion of an additional 128 beds. County Project Manager Ken Moore gave some input on the option he prefers. Option one looks the most reasonable uh, in terms of, you know, our limitations with with financing it's probably more reasonable at the 309 million dollar mark being able to hit that 2028. The county is aiming to accommodate a total of 1300 beds by 2028 and more than 1500 beds by 2053 across the current and new jail facilities. Both design options bring the bed totals above or close to those targets. To be clear, these new facilities hinge on approval from Spokane County voters. In November, they'll have to decide whether to pass a 0.2% sales tax increase that will pay for the new jail. Reporting from the Spokane County Jail, Amanda Rowley, Creme 2 News. Tonight, we've learned that former assistant professor has been released to jail, according to the inmate roster. Today, North Idaho College putting out a statement essentially summarizing what happened this morning and afternoon. But first, here's what we know about the man arrested. His name is Zachary Schalbetter, and the college says he was hired last fall as an assistant professor to teach web and graphic design. His contract, however, ended last week on May 12th. According to the college, Shawbetter allegedly walked into trustee Todd Banducci's Coeur d'Alene office unannounced, went past the reception area and verbally threatened him, then threw a large bucket of liquid over Banducci's desk, soaking him, his computer and other office equipment. The college says Banducci and others restrained Shawbetter until Coeur d'Alene police arrived. He's being charged with battery and malicious injury to property. Now there is a special board meeting scheduled for tomorrow night and it'll be interesting to see if Banducci addresses and talks about what happened here. We're also going to try to get a copy of the court documents and police report. But for now, reporting outside the Kootenai County Jail, Kyle Simchuk, Krim 2 News. North Idaho College says the liquid in that bucket was a mixture of water and cleaning chemicals. Trustee Todd Banducci did not address the incident at tonight's meeting, but the college president did and called the behavior unacceptable. Zachary Schalbetter is the former North Idaho College assistant professor arrested this week. The college says he went to trustee Todd Banducci's private business, threatened him, then dumped a bucket of water and cleaning chemicals over his desk, soaking Banducci, his computer, and other office equipment. Earlier today, Schalbetter agreed to speak with Krem 2, then changed his mind and said he would send a statement instead. As of late tonight, we haven't received one. Well, let me be clear. Violence and physical intimidation are simply not okay, not on this campus and, um, or in any setting. The North Idaho College has zero tolerance for violence, period. During tonight's special meeting, President Nick Swain reiterated the fact that Schalbetter was on a one-year contract teaching web and graphic design. That contract ended last week. His departure from NIC had nothing to do with Trustee Venducci or any member of the board or any adverse action. So his actions made absolutely no sense to me. Schalbetter was arrested Wednesday and posted bond. He only spent a few hours in jail. He's facing charges of battery and malicious injury to property. He made his first court appearance this morning. And we were able to chat with Trustee Banducci after the meeting outside and off camera. He told us that he's okay, just a little shaken up by everything. And so are a lot of the women in his office. He's just glad that nothing more violent occurred. Reporting from North Idaho College tonight, Kyle Simchuk, Krim 2 News. Washington State Patrol is using an extra set of eyes to track speeding drivers from the sky. WSP says street racing is a nationwide issue. State Trooper Ryan Sanger says Washington is no stranger to reckless driving. We do see an uptick in trend of that when the weather gets nicer. To keep drivers and the public safe, WSP is using planes to track crime on the roads. WSP says it'll be flying a traffic plane over Spokane County every night through Saturday. They're here in Spokane this, uh, this week to help assist with uh, enforcement and to locate uh, reckless drivers for us. The extra resource is something Spokane resident Patty Bergman says she's thankful for. Bergman lives off Division Street and says high speed driving needs to be addressed. I was so happy to see that something needs to be done and I'm shocked 
that more accidents haven't happened. I mean, you hear about the accidents all the time, but I'm, you know, we just wait for the crash. You know, especially when they're going so darn fast. This dash camera footage shows what excessive speeding looks like from the sky. These videos are from multiple WSP vehicle pursuits in western Washington. Uh, Smoky through, you can turn it off and we'll follow north from 212. Under state law, law enforcement can begin a pursuit if a person poses serious risk of harm to others. WSP says it has investigated over 60 deadly crashes since the beginning of the year. The more times people do this, the more times you repeat the behavior, more like higher, very higher likelihood of a, of a crash, serious injury, injuring yourself, other people. So yeah, we, um, our goal is to be out here and apprehend people that are committing crimes as safely and effectively as possible. And this is one of those resources that we absolutely love using in terms uh, for that. The agency says people may see planes flying overhead during high traffic events like the Lilac Festival and Hoop Fest. Janelle Finch, Creme 2 News. When you put a ball in front of people, people just start kicking it around. Thrive International's youth program is bringing back one of their most popular programs for refugee youth. But it's in danger of getting cut. We just want to create a safe space for the kids to be and uh, know that they are welcomed. Jackson Lino is a director for Thrive's youth program and coordinates a soccer camp. He knows the impact it can leave. We believe that uh, when they come together, they're able to gain that uh, confidence and get to know the community that they're around. Thrive hopes to send 100 students for free this year. That's because... We know a lot of, a lot of our refugee immigrant kids are low on, on the budget. So Jackson tells me that 20 refugee youth have already signed up for this year's soccer camp, but in order to kick off the soccer program, they need to raise $10,000. Without the funds, mastering something like juggling the soccer ball uh, won't be possible. It'll be hard to put something like that together because, you know, putting, something, putting a soccer camp together requires funding. Thrive International Director Mark Finney hopes it doesn't have to come to that. A fundraiser has already raised more than $600. It's important because a lot of kids are coming here and they don't have a lot of relationships, a lot of friends. Uh, English is something that they're learning, so sometimes it's hard to relate to folks. But soccer is a universal language. The camp is set for June 26 to 29 at North Central High School. And with more than a month to go, Thrive hopes to score in all the goals. In Spokane, Nathan Hyun, Krem 2 News. Thank you for joining us here on Krem 2 Plus for a look at some of the biggest news stories of the past week. For the most current news throughout the weekend, you can watch our latest newscast right here on Krem 2 Plus. Just look for them in the bottom navigation menu. I'm Tim Pham. Thanks for watching.